what makes the world famous Kenton Club famous? Does everybody know why it's famous? Why? You don't know? No, you're Cal Welsh. Come here. Tell the story. Share your love. Come on. Get on here. Uh, Raquel Welsh was in a movie and part of it was shot here. That's all I know. Raquel Welsh loved this club. Who loves Raquel Welsh? R.I.P. Raquel. Um, there are some roller skates up there that I'm going to say touch the feet of the Welsh. Right there. Um, no, this place is just such a classic Portland venue and we're thrilled to bring you all here, to make sure that we're acknowledging that our music ecology is just cool and quirky and independent and different than places that are built entirely to capitalize on music, and even worse, to extract the value of local music and take it somewhere else. And the reason I bring it up and say it that way is that Live Nation is working hard to come to Portland. And we are working hard to protect our independent venue community, which Live Nation has proven in many other venue, many other cities that they are predatory, that they are, you know, they are not supportive players, um, and Somebody coined our music ecology as a coral reef. And I think that's exactly it. People come here and they go to music here, no matter what the style is, if it's cumbia or punk or bluegrass, or, and they feel differently because these spaces are these hallowed spaces that are really important. And Live Nation takes everything, groups them all together, and tells you what you need to care about. Instead of liking, letting local independent music curators in our local independently owned venues tell you what they think is cool and leave it to you to decide. So, in September, our first Monday is on a Tuesday. Oh, I lied. I lied. It's, no, it's on a second Monday. It's on September 11th. Whoa, even crazier. I know, I know. It's a little edgy. Um, September 11th at the Bunk Bar, in sight of the spot that Live Nation wants to build a giant venue that will, given their history, very likely kill the Roseland, the Crystal, the Wonder and then they'll work down from there. Because in other music ecologies where they have um, moved in, they don't just go for the big stuff. They want to build a whole, they call it vertical integration um, in the market. And they, in some places, have gone down as far as a 50 cap room. So this venue would be at risk. Every venue in our city would be at risk if this corporate entertainment conglomerate comes to our city. And we need to stand up for what we need. September 11th, come to our first Monday. It's going to be entirely talking about this topic. It's going to be talking with experts. And it is going to be in sight of the space that they are claiming they can plug in and not hurt us. We also have just created musicportland.org forward slash live nation. Everybody go there because we are going to continue. There's already... 40 different links that tell the story of what Live Nation does in a, in a community when they come there. It is other communities talking about the fight that they've had. Go get her, Mira. It's not just me, honey. It's all y'all. Come on. But go to musicportland.org forward slash Live Nation and educate yourself about what this means and then tell other people about it and get them all to come to September 11th, to our next second Monday. Um, and, uh, you know, let's decide what kind of music ecology we want to have. Um, that's it for me. But we have uh, Renee, amazing Renee, is going to talk about the Echo Fund. How many people applied for the Echo Fund? Woohoo! 
I am short, alas. Um, <laughs> uh, so, wow. Okay, so I think I'm assuming the other people that applied for the Echo Fund are still at home typing away, trying to s turn it in. Uh, I realized that. I was like, that was probably a mistake to put that the same night as First Monday. But... Uh, anyway, uh, just a little announcement about that. Um, so far, we've received, well, there's a lot more in progress, but 160 submissions for the ECHO Fund. For, and, and that estimates to about, um, there's like an average, 4,075 was like the average of what people were asking for. And that amounts to almost about $650,000 in ask. And we have about 45? to give away. Yeah. So just FYI, it's a little bit under 10% that we're gonna be able to fund. Uh, so, and the only reason I'm saying that is just because there's obviously a really big need and we're seeing that. And um, there's a lot kind of going on in the grant community too. But we're, too. Telling, we're tell, explaining to the city that the need is great. Correct. So every yeah. one of those applications, even if they're denied, is telling a story that I think in the face of RAC being unfunded, they're looking to figure out where culture needs to be supported. And these are incredibly powerful pieces of data to be communicating. <laughs> the deadline is as, as it strikes midnight tonight, so you still have time. Just, uh, you know, have an informed budget is all I'll say. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, you have time, go home tonight. If you, if you start an application, you still have time. And uh, I guess there's a few tips I would say if you are going to still submit, or if even if you did submit, you can get back into your application before midnight tonight. Um, I would say make sure, again, like your budget is clear that there's a clear total ask. Some people wrote line items and there's not a total, and that can be hard to like, you know, I, it's a lot for the, all of our panelists to just go through and like add things up ourselves, like make it easy for us to understand, you know? Um, couple other tips. Uh, make sure your zip code is on there because we have to find out if you're in the right area. And if your zip code's not on there, then we have to disqualify the application and we don't want to do that at all. So definitely do that. Um, and uh, also just pay attention to the start and end dates of the grant as well. Um, nothing we're funding can start before October 1st and it can't be, it has to end by July 1st, 2024. So those are just seemingly simple things, but I've seen a lot of people not follow those simple things, and so I just wanted to make sure to mention that. So I know not a lot of you have started to do that, or it sounds like it's not too many of you, but it still maybe reaches the right person, and I appreciate that, that can, I have that opportunity to do that. So, all right, that's all I gotta say. Yay! This woman has killed herself for this grant. Like, it's amazing what she has done. She's the one, give her a round of applause. Seriously, she cares so deeply about every single application that comes in. She's like, oh, this one is good, but this. And so she's coming through and making sure that people hear what they need to do to be better and what they do to be eligible. So super, super exciting. Somebody asked about RAC, right? Okay, so RAC was defunded, or they, they, they were told they were not going to have their, um, their contract renewed. RAC gets seven point something um, million dollars a year in financing from the kind of the arts tax, which I think is, is, was well-intentioned, but is pretty challenged, you know? They don't enforce it. People, some people pay it, some people don't. It's supposed to provide primarily art supplies to students across the city. It uh, doesn't do that. <laughs> um, so we know of uh, teachers that are working in multiple schools and finding that the inequity in terms of those art supplies is horrific. Like the places that really need it are not being supported and the places that don't need it are being boosted to make sure that people feel good and warm and fuzzy about giving to the arts tax. So it's, it's been a complicated season. Um, RAC had a functional assessment or audit by the city in 2019 where they failed. 
and they have been challenged ever since to kind of come forward. Jamie Dunphy, who many of you know, is our Music Policy Council man uh, chair and member of our board, and he, when he worked for Nick Fish, um, was absolutely focused on getting RAC to do better, getting RAC to actually fulfill its obligations. And he is the one who publicly cheers with his whole body when he heard that this thing is not refunded. So um, I think we can do better. Portland can do better. And one of the things that Music Portland wants to do is to become a nonprofit, non-governmental agency in the same way that Travel Portland and Venture Portland are um, to actually make sure that proportionate funding is channeled to the music community and appropriate promotion and economic development efforts are applied to the area music community. So um, we feel like this is an interruption of what has been. I feel badly for some of the arts organizations that I think are thrown into a real uproar, but I think it's the moment when we need culture the most, and I think it's a moment when we can reimagine how culture can be supported, both ours and other people's. So I see it as a good thing. Um, how'd I do? You did great. Okay, the that's... I think, yeah, RAC, RAC is designed to focus on arts and culture with the capital A. And that's what it was designed for. Back when it was created 18 years ago, it was designed to support the art that didn't have any market earning capacity. What's changed in 18 years is that popular music has had its lunch eaten by streaming it's had all kinds of changes to the way that mon money, uh, music is monetized, and we need more. We need a different, intelligent approach to music support. So um, it isn't that RAC is bad for that or that RAC was excluding us by design, except they were because we didn't need it. Things have changed, and it's time for a reassessment. So. This is our board president, Kate O'Brien. She's very bossy. Do you see how bossy? You people don't know how I suffer. All right, I'm going to, I'm gonna bring up the main event tonight. I am so excited, just and honored that Gabri Waddell, who is the founder of Sound Credit, um, who in 2018, when we created Music Portland, nobody knew us at all. And I talked to this guy and he said, whatever you need, give, give your people my stuff for free. Just give it, like, like let's get it, like, let's work together. He like immediately saw what we were trying to do and I have been in awe of what he has done in all of this time. To be coming back together at this point um, is incredibly moving. It's just like, he's come all the way from Memphis for the good weather. That's the reason he's here. Because <laughs> you know Memphis is a hellscape right now in terms of summer weather. Um, but he has come here. This, this technology that he's created is entirely centered on making sure that you all do better. It is incredibly sensitive to the challenges that you face. And he is committed to making Music Portland members actually um, benefit from that in a way. It's gonna be half price for Music Portland members to use his system, and you will see that you will make more in the first month of using his system than you will ever, ever pay. It's $5 a month at a minimum. It's, it's, it's incredible. You're gonna love what you see. All right, I'm gonna bring Adam Gonzalez of Telegraph Mastering to ask Gabri some hard questions. Take him through his paces, dude. All right, come on up, gentlemen. I love you all. Man, the Clinton Club always smells fantastic. Oh my God, this this the smell of fried food. It's gonna yeah. Chicken wings are good? All right. 
All right, so um, it's such a pleasure to be here, and I'm going to get into why I feel that it's such a pleasure to be here in just a moment. Uh, first, I'm going to give you a little background about what brought me to this point with Sound Credit and um, what the motivation behind the platform uh, was for me. Uh, so, uh, next slide. So this was my first band. That's me in the middle. I was playing. I was 15 years old, Memphis, Tennessee. We were, uh, we had a metal band called Crash Pattern, and we were taking all the gigs that we could. And the to my left in that photo is Kari Wynn, uh, was my closest friend at the time. A few years after this photo, he was hired to play guitar for Public Enemy, and he'd stayed on the road with them for about. I guess it's been about 25 years now. Uh, so with this, he became their music director. Incredible, incredible talent. And everyone knew it from day one. If you knew Kari, Kari was, um, he was fire. And so um, I watched over the years that he would go from country to country, from gig to gig. He would, he would be on these songwriting sessions. He was doing so much music. We were so excited to see these things come out in record stores, you know, when record stores were still going the way that they were. Um, it, was, it was tremendous. But what we didn't realize in those first years is that he needed to sign up for a PRO. He needed to have split sheets signed. He needed so many of the details taken care of that today would have resulted in, in him living in a different zip code that he lives in currently. It was wrong. And we realized that over a number of years, you know, throughout our 20s and everything, you know, we came to realize what was needed and that pain was there. So let's go uh, to the next slide here. So to, to give you a little bit of background about my family, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. The second man that you see in the photo here is my uncle Lucius. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is a more clear photo of him, the man in the brimmed hat. This is one of the most famous civil rights photos of the sanitation strike uh, that happened that brought Martin Luther King to Memphis before the unfortunate event uh, that, uh, that, uh, that transpired. Uh, eight of my family members are present for Martin Luther King's last speech. My aunt sang in the choir. Um, and I mention that to say that for me, upholding the rights of a community and the all, all that it takes to advocate for a community is part of what's in my family's blood. We've always done this. We've always looked for ways to do what's needed to to, to be right by communities and find the community that we represent. And um, so it's very meaningful to me if you go to the next one. And so for me in my journey, as I continued in mastering, I always had that seed of what my family's history happened to be together with, uh, you know, understanding what happened uh, with my friend Kari. And as my career uh, continued to progress, I, you know, it really was in mastering at the beginning. I mastered so many records in my 20s. That's why Adam and I are so are, uh, such friends. You know, I, I understand the uh, world of mastering and all the details there. I wrote the best-selling book on audio mastering, published by McGraw Hill. Uh, I did a plug-in called Refinement. Uh, I've always done coding. If I wasn't doing music, I was doing uh, software development. And so I did a, a plug-in called Refinement that I licensed to Universal Audio and Brainworks. Uh, in my uh, early 30s that uh, was a, a, a very popular plug-in at the time. And I decided I didn't want to just continue, and continue licensing things out to other companies. I wanted to start a company, uh, raise some investment, and, uh, and, and make a go of it you know, with a company based in Memphis, not just licensing out to a company in California and Germany, but to do something as a symbol of Memphis and Memphis music and its history and legacy. And, um, and so that's, that's what, what occurred. And so a few months after we launched the company, originally it was a plug-in company called Soundways, we did this plug-in called RenM. When we released RenM, we tried to release it out to maybe 40 or 50 testers uh, on the night that we had it prepared and we're going to do this release. Uh, when we woke up, there were more shares for RenM, this credit plug-in, than any other software across music production social media. So for NAM and Tape Op and, and uh, 
Pro Tools users, Pro Tools expert. Uh, there were more shares for RenM than any other software, even any previous version of, um, of Pro Tools. So that got our attention for sure. And so we pivoted to be exclusively about music credits. And that brought me here to Portland. So um, this was over at Holocene uh, in an event that we did with, uh, with Larry Crane. It was a Recording Academy event that night. And this is where it all started to change for me, especially hearing Larry's story about fiercely representing independent artists. And I'll never forget the advice that he gave to me. He said that you have to be true to artists. If the deep, the tape op has always been about recognizing individuals and their contributions, not just the big, not just the, you know, the full spectrum of producers and engineers, you know, are there in tape op. And if you, that was the, that was the secret sauce. And understanding that from Larry was very central to me. And also remember this night, uh, the platform was so young at this time. We just, we had the plug-in, we didn't have, you know, the, just at the very beginning at, in these days. And Larry said, wait a minute, so am I gonna put the drummer's mailing address into the plug-in when I'm setting up drum mics? And I, I remember thinking, oh no, that's not exactly right. You know, we were starting to absorb the, uh, the needs and the realities around music credits and information and uh, to create a platform that really can work for real people in real situations. So I'm gonna advance a little bit to today um, with sound credit and the modern version of sound credit. We've come a long way uh, since 2018 for sure. Uh, so there is the sound credit desktop app and it's all, it also works as a web app. Uh, we today have, this says 16,000, we're just, we probably hit 17,000 users this morning. Uh, and that's over 60 countries. Um, we go to the next one. And there is also now the sound credit kiosk, so people can check into a recording session just right there at the intro of the at the entrance of the studio or inside the studio. We've actually found that placing them in studios makes it easier. If you're listening back to a mix or a master, you can uh, pop over to the kiosk and check in super easy. And there is the sound credit mobile app uh, as well, so you can enter credits, edit, uh, edit information, also use our playlist feature, which I'll talk about. And um, we can go to the next one. And there is also the sound credit plugin. This is where it all started for us. Uh, it's it's much advanced since those early days, but the plugin is still there. And here's the thing: the music industry needs a Dropbox killer. And this is what took us many years to recognize, is that we built the most powerful platform for music credits. And, uh, and so many people's energy and passion and, and everything went into building this platform. Uh, it, it's not just myself, there's a team of developers that have been working on this alongside you know, myself as well. But uh, we, um, we poured a lot into this and after we had this this platform for music credits in this way, we realized that decoupling, sending the files from credits was where, where things went wrong. Because if you think about it, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, when we were using analog tape, you would have the track sheet that would come along with the reel-to-reel -reel tape, and it had information there. And I'll never forget going to, uh, to uh, Warner's vault in Burbank and the person that manages the vault was telling me that the further you go back in music history, the better the data quality gets. Which is, it, it almost doesn't make sense. We're in the information age. Like, what, what happened here? How is this possible? But the, what happened is that in the digital revolution, when people started sending files and recordings through general purpose file transfer platforms like Dropbox, WeTransfer, and Google Drive, we lost the practice of sending information along with the recordings. And when we built the most powerful platform for music credits and information, the part that was missing was the file transfer portion of it. And so we dug so deeply into this. We built a new streaming service for this uh, that can, it's almost like if Spotify and we transfer had a baby, it would be the new, oh, if we can go back one. 
Oh, uh, yeah, one more. The Sound Credit Playlist feature. So with this, um, you're able to enter information into Sound Credit at your leisure, but it's really about transferring files. And what happens, if we can go to the next one, is that when you send a file through Sound Credit, you can see the download all button there. And if you click that, it kind of looks like we transfer. It gives you a little download status. And you can allow people to just do streaming only. It's also really nice going from your DAW over to a streaming service that you can then play on your phone. No account creation is needed. You can just send someone a link. They don't have to install anything. It's super easy. We don't even collect emails, none of that. As soon as you get that sound credit link, you can press play and start streaming the audio. So if you're delivering something, if you're a tracking engineer, mixing engineer, mastering engineer, if it's at any stage of production, or if you're a label that's sending things out for pitching or a publisher, uh, it makes that experience really, really nice. You can also disable the download all if you want someone to do it. But here's the thing. It says credits, zero. I prepared this uh, last night. When you see this credit zero, you know something's wrong. And that's what draws people into the greater platform. Come for the file transfers, stay for the credits. That's what it's about. So we go to the next one. Uh, and with Sound Credit, we set about making the world's best platform for music file transfers. So you get the streaming view, but if you click, click the little chat, little icon that's there, it takes you into track chat. So you can drop a, uh, a marker at any point in the waveform, and you can make a comment, and it'll go over there on the right. And um, you, you have a sequence of comments that are there. You can also move that range around that you see. And, uh, and make a comment on a range. Maybe you want someone to lay a guitar solo in a certain spot, you can do that super easy. Uh, you know, with the range, just show them where they're, gonna, where they're gonna record. Or if you're trying to you know, communicate that the vocals are too loud, starting at a certain section, you could drop a pin there and make a comment. Super easy to communicate about revisions this way. And then when you make changes to the recording, you can upload separate versions. And so what you see there where it says active version V1, you can upload a new version and people can still cycle through the old versions. Because you know how it is, a lot of times you do five versions and you, you want to go back to version one and just use that. So we, uh, we enable that in sound credit. <laughs> So um, there's the little track markers over there on each of the chat uh, windows. There's one, this is actually a track I've been working on. I still do uh, the production uh, uh, every year, at least an album or two. And so that one is one I'm working on with Sean Ardoin right now. And I was saying, hey, I think that, um, uh, I think that break could be a little, we could break, that breakdown could be a little further broken down, is basically what I'm saying. So uh, you can click that marker and it'll take you specifically to that play point, which is really nice. It's just super convenient, you know, and adding this convenience around it makes it where it's impossible to go back to Dropbox after you've experienced Sound Credit Playlist and Track Chat. So in just 90 days, we just launched the Playlist and Track Chat feature 90 days ago. And uh, well, in April, and in just that time, we've eclipsed every other music-specific file transfer service. So, Sampley, uh, FilePass, uh, Disco AC, uh, every the the other companies that were in that space. Uh, in just that amount of time, uh, that has happened. Uh, so, Sound Credit is now there. Now we're going after the big dogs. Dropbox, we transfer in Google Drive. And what comes along with sending your files this way? It means that you can um, you can have credits go along with the files, and it goes even more deep than that. So we, we'll uh, we'll continue. Ninety-eight percent of all music releases in Nashville today go through Sound Credit, and that's for Universal, Warner, Sony, Thirty Tigers, Big Machine, Curb Records. We've grown it tremendously since the last time I was here in Portland. Uh, I'm very happy to say. And one of the things that um, is present there is that you can. Um, you can export the information to many different destinations that need it. So if you enter your credits in Sound Credit, one button export the information to Sound Exchange. One button uh, export to ASCAP, BMI, and SOCAN. One button, and the list goes on. We were just talking about the B4 and the B9 forms uh, for the AF of M. So if you're doing a union session, 
You can export the union contracts directly from Sal Credit. And now today there are over 92 integrations with the platform. And we have an engineer specifically on doing exports and integrations today, uh, which has helped, helped us to grow in this way. And every export that we, that we do has made the platform just that, that little much, that little bit better. So it's, been, it's really been tremendous. So uh, this is, uh, we announced this uh, uh, advanced uh, option uh, just a little bit ago this past Grammys uh, with PPL. So if people are uh, able to collect neighboring rights royalties, then they can uh, do that through Sound Credit. Uh, as we get more into having not just registration of credits in Sound Credit, but also have it where you can um, you can be paid your royalties through the exact same platform. Uh, th those options are there. And there are options if you want to use your own publishing administrator and digital distribution and neighboring rights organization, you can. But if you want Sound Credit to do it, we'll do it. And what does that mean? That means that Kari Wynn, those years ago, that problem, that Kari Wynn that is in Portland today, or wherever he is, would not have had those issues. He wouldn't have been in that position where he wasn't exposed to the, all the needs that, that are there if you're on that arc. We've solved the problem and we've done it in a, in a, uh, in a very practical way, a way that draws you into the platform at the beginning to use the file transfer aspect. So you can see the credit zero and wonder what that is, to click into it and find easy credit options and then to explore the export section and find out oh I can click this button and register here and there you know to streamline this process and now we finally have a revolutionary platform for streamlining the music industry supply chain thank you incredible well done sir uh, before we um, open it up for questions and comments with the audience, I had uh, a comment and then a question myself. Yeah. So um, the comment is, uh, one of the things that I'm not sure that came through in, in Gibri's presentation is uh, over the years, the sound credit platform, which is you know, designed to uh, gather credits, store credits, and have those credits travel with digital files wherever they're going, uh, and now to, to help with delivery if you're mixing uh, or mastering or just sending things for to share with people, how friction-free it is. Uh, they're really, um, you couldn't uh, really see it in the, uh, in the slide, but, but if you're, let's say you're a mixing engineer um, or you're a mastering engineer or you just want to send um, a, a take that you did uh, to somebody else who's in your band, they don't have to download anything. They don't have to enter in their email. There's, there's nothing that's asked of them. They just get a link, and then there's a player that's on their phone, and they can choose to download it. They can choose to stream it directly. It, there's, there's no bumps. There's nothing to sign up for. It's, it is truly, truly friction-free, which is, I think, very rare these days in, in services that provide this kind of value. So I wanted to, to point that out. It, um, sometimes when people hear about this stuff, it's like, yeah, but I got to, what's the, you need, what do you need, my, my SMS number for texting me some bullshit later? They, he doesn't do that. <laughs> so I wanted to give that comment right away and, and kudos for, for making that fully friction free because that's, that's really important. So the, the question that I had for you is, uh, I think when, one of the first things that people look at when they see this, this comprehensive capture system for credits all along the, the, the food chain, right? You, if you played slide guitar on track three, you get credit for that, and that, that stays with the track through the life of the track, wherever it goes. If you were the tracking engineer, or you were the producer, or you were the mixing engineer, all of that stays with the track. What, what's the workflow for a person who's new to the system for capturing that data and making sure that it stays in there? Because I think the first, people, the first thing that people think is, well, that's data entry. So where does that data entry happen and who's doing that data entry? Yeah, so if uh, in different projects it's different, of course. The music industry is never one size fits all. 
But if you think about it through like the major label lens, most of the time, well, virtually all the time, it's the producer that is responsible for delivering this information. Whether they use sound credit or not, they're going to have to supply it to the labels. And uh, Universal made it um, a requirement for submission at one point with Studio Hub. You know, you pretty much had to submit in order for the producer to get paid. They would have to do this. And so um, that's so the job has been there with the producer. And so what we do with sound credit, like if you're producing a record, it's actually really nice to get it get those details down in the moment. So you let's say you enter things in sound credit, um, you're using sound credit, you've got your songs, you got your demos, you're just using it for file transfers at the beginning. And then you're in the studio and you've got you you have you have some things going on. Instead of getting out a notepad or making some notes in your phone about it, you just pop into the Sound Credit mobile app and you can add the credit right then or whenever. You know, whenever is most convenient to you. Is it just makes it super easy for you to get it down. If you're on your laptop, you can just get it down then. And it's really nice like, as you see your project build and you have both the credits and the files in the same place. And when you send it around, like, people feel appreciated. Plus, it, your, your project looks you know, it just looks more professional, but people, it, but it really comes down to the people. As if you get a sound credit link and you see your own credit on there, you feel appreciated. You feel taken care of, you know, and so it, it makes it super easy to do that. People are able to see it in the moment. We've also noticed that that helps people to catch issues. So if they're doing a file transfer, it says credit five or something. People click on that song that they're on. They look at the credits then they can say, hey, oh, I'm not on track five, I notice. And then in seconds, they can just pop into their app, add the credit, and they're good to go. Uh, also with sound credit, if you're making a file transfer, you can send a link, but you can also click collaborate in a playlist or a sound credit project. And the person themselves, if you've clicked collaborate and given them this, uh, these rights, uh, which is just selecting co-admin in the, in the drop down, it's there by default. Uh, then they can actually go in and, and add the credit themselves. So that was something that we noticed actually with you and you and Amy Dragon at the beginning is that when we first launched Sound Credit, you know, we ha we contemplated having this music database. You know, in the very early days, we still have the Sound Credit Indie database, and people can still upload there. It's uh, one of the 92 exports and integrations. But with this. Um, we start to realize that it is very convenient for people to enter their own credit. So we've made that flow. Now it's just heavily evolved now with the playlists and projects. You hit collaborate, people can drop it in themselves, producer can enter it, whatever way works. Yeah, that's, that's, it's really powerful. And I'd, I'd like you to speak also to, to how these credits travel, right? So um, as credits are moving from role to role, so let's say we're, we're tracking, and I get the credit for OG1, he did production, um, and Mira played tambourine. But those are the only two credits that are in there, and then it moves on to the mixing engineer, right? Mm -hmm. So now it's moved from the roles, but the credits are traveling with the files as they move from the tracking engineer to the mixing engineer. Is that, that's correct? That's exactly right. So if the tracking engineer sends it with sound credit, then, uh, and if they send it with the collaborate fe feature, then the mix engineer can download the files just like they would from Dropbox or WeTransfer, but they can also just pop in there and add the credits themselves, their own credit. And let's say they don't, because not everybody uses sound credit for the early parts of it, you know, uh, they, may, they may not know about it yet, and let's say it happens in the middle, so it just at any point you can add the credits. So it, let's say that it's let's say it's done, it's mastered, it's completely done. Let's say it's a project from six months ago, you know, or whatever that's about to be released. Then you can do it at that point too. You know, we've tried to make it as easy as possible for each point, each potential use scenario for it to work for them. So let's say you're doing it at the end of the project. And uh, and people have it hasn't traveled through with the most ideal flow, and you're just at the end of it. Then there is a select from saved profiles option. It's really cool. So you can pop into Sound Credit if you ever enter someone into Sound Credit once. You don't even have to go hit save on their profile. It automatic automatically saves that profile to your account, 
And then from then on, if you just start typing that person's name, yeah. then it's going to pop up. And if you don't want to type at all, you can go to select from save profiles. You hit the tick box by each person. And if you've ever added them before, they'll be in there. And then boom, they're in there. Uh, so you can go from no credits, no data entry at all, to having a full lineup if you've ever entered those people before, literally in five seconds. Yeah, the one of the the really powerful and easy things about Gabriel's platform is 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 exactly this. So it's it's almost like on your phone if you're making a purchase and you begin to enter in your address or your credit card number and it finishes it for you. It, you know, if I've worked with Larry Crane before, I've worked with OG One before, I've worked with Cameron Spees before, I just have to type the first couple letters of their name. And it says, oh, you mean Larry, or you mean Cameron. And then it just goes in, yes, this person did production on this. So it's the, um, I don't mean to, to belabor the point, but the, the data entry part has been much, much diminished. It's really, really, really easy. Yeah, there's not, I don't think, there's not a single person that got into music so they could do data entry. <laughs> so <laughs> we have to make it as painless as possible. And, and we spent six years on that. Yes. It's really good now. Um, last question before we open it up to, to questions from the audience. The, uh, so the other things about the platform, like there's, there's a code generation feature. I mean, the, the platform really takes uh, uh, the song and tries to wrap as much data around the song as possible so that it travels with the song. Can you speak a little bit about uh, some of the other things that you can attach to a song so that it travels? Absolutely. So... Uh you can you can almost in SoundCloud you can almost accidentally well administer your song, so you can hit the generate ISRC button and it will generate an ISRC code for you and it's just gonna put it in there. You know you don't even have to think about it, it's just done. If you want a grid code uh, for releases, you just click the generate grid code button. If anything's missing in order to generate those codes, like for ISRC codes, uh, you have to have a release date as part of the required metadata, then just a little message is going to pop up and say, hey, release date required, stuff like that. That if you were, you know, uh, Kari or I back in these days, we wouldn't know what the requirements are for an ISRC code or wherever place on the internet we might buy one from if we were trying to get one. Uh, so sound credit takes care of all that for you it's making sure that you it, it has all the guardrails there for you uh, and then isni codes uh international standard name identifier uh there's there's like 12 david porters in the music industry uh there's the songwriter that wrote hold on i'm coming as soul man who's an amazing songwriter hall of famer there's a david porter who was who did the music and composition for um for walking dead if you're trying to pay royalties which David Porter are we talking about? You know, it's a very important thing to know. And so with ISNI codes, it's a, it, it's a standard identifier for creators. And it's really big in the book world. Like almost every author is identified through their ISNI code. And now it's growing like tremendously in the music world. Uh, Apple Music is now taking it. It's, it's really huge. So uh, sound credit, we, we were early in this. We, I, I think that we catalyzed ISNI being used in the music industry to this degree. Uh, we're the largest registrant of ISNI codes for the music industry, which we're really proud of. We built the system, the first ever free and automated system for ISNI code registration back in 2020. And even if no one knows or cares what ISNI code is, we don't even want people to know or care, really. We just want them to have it. So you click a button and you can register for your own ISNI and then it will be in your profile. Or if you're entering a credit for someone, you can click the little generate ISNI button and you go through a few steps and it's going to generate the ISNI for them. Um, those are the kinds of things that we built into the platform, make it easy for folks to get codes and identifiers and that kind of thing. I know codes are boring and it's and people tend to, their eyes tend to glaze over, but true story about ISNI, uh, there's another Adam Gonzalez. Uh, he's in a metal band in South Florida called Leather Ass Fuck Kill. <laughs> and I would like to make sure that my mastering credits... We, yeah, I mean, we're, we're indistinguishable. But yeah, I would, I'd like to make sure my mastering credits are not mixed up with the Leather Ass Fuck Kill credits. <laughs> yes. yes that happens all the time. That's hilarious. Uh, okay, let's let's see what anybody have any questions for Gabriel? Yeah, what's up? Man? Yeah, I got a question that uh, directly relates to leather ass fuck 
killed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what if there's a mistake made at the very beginning? A collaborator's name is spelled or it's not even the right person. How far does that get? I mean, what if it gets all the way to a release date and it's like, oh hell, that's not the right guy. How do you make that change to make it right? Yeah, so we're mitigating the risk of that almost as far as you possibly can do. So let's say someone is not using sound credit and they're using a Word document, you know, or they're using something in their phone or uh, like there's a producer in Nashville, I won't say his name, but he uses a notepad that's in his pocket. Uh, God forbid he leaves his notepad at home that day of the session. Uh, but with this, um, you can, with sound credit, you enter that profile one time ever and then it's in your account. So you're, it's going to minimize that. So let's say you did misspell it because, hey, mistake, we can't stop people from, you know, having a typo. But what we can do is when every time you recall it, it's there. So if you, fi if you fix it, you fixed it forever. So those are the kinds of things. And you're not retyping with sound credit. You know, if you're doing the, you're doing the credit, somebody's using Word or something to do it, then they're retyping things constantly. Easy, much easier to make a mistake than sound credit where you're entering a profile everything's nice and easy readable you know it just those kinds of cues reduce the potential for error completely you can never eliminate all potential for error but i think we've done just uh we, we've got it almost as far as you possibly could take it and as a follow-up if it's, if it's in there correctly if it's locked right it cannot be changed by anybody well, it, it can't be changed. If you have a, a profile in your own account, that's exactly right. No one else can change your saved profiles. Uh, so that's there. We also, there are two types of profiles in SoundCredit. We have the SoundCredit creator IDs. So you can get our creator ID app, or if you set up a SoundCredit account, you can go into your account and change your details. When you have a SoundCredit creator ID, then anyone can pull down those global creator IDs for someone and not have to type it. So uh, same, like, it, like I was saying, if you enter someone once, then you never have to enter it again. But if they got a creator ID that they manage themselves, you don't even have to enter it the first time because it's just going to, you can pull down from their own managed creator ID. So that's another piece uh, that's there. So people can manage their own creator ID, and then you also have your saved profiles that are your own private collection uh, that you can edit. So if you did make a mistake, you could go in and edit it. Or if the, you know you want to, they change publishing companies or something like that, you can go in and make your your necessary changes. So yeah. Thank you. Oh, sure. Yeah, Bruce. Um, you mentioned our report forms. With our report forms, they serve in essence also as a W T, a W two, or W four. Do these? Is there any tax information on any of this information that's required for distributions? So, for when it comes to the union forms, we have put so we've put, put so much time on those union forms, like vastly more than any other export in sound credit because of everything that's required there. Now, one of the things, you know, team has to process the forms. And so they need, at the minimum, the last four digits of the Social Security number. But some contractors and others want the full Social Security number in there. So we had to do all the security around that. If you, create a, if you do a creator ID, then there's a whole separate process for that. It says, are you a union member? And it goes through a whole separate process at that point. All this stuff is encrypted uh, at rest. It's uh, encrypted during transit so that we can uh, make sure that that part is secured. So the union forms are definitely a very special and specific, uh, you know, application within an application in this way. Uh, so that that gives you a little bit of a glimpse into what's gone into it. Also, it, the B4 and B9s are not just one single click and it exports. When you hit the B4 and you go in, you click into it, but it, it takes you through a review. If you set up all your profiles right, then you pretty much are clicking through, but there are some things that are specific to union forms that we don't want everyone else to have to deal with or see. Uh, stuff like the type of session, you know, if it's good, and you all have the specific types of sessions that are for the B4s and B9s and the forms there. So uh, you can click those in that special little um, sequence that happens if you do the uniform export. Thank you. Thank you.
Where are you storing that data? Is that private cloud or public cloud? Uh, so it, it's um, it's in it's with AWS. So there are different types of databases that are used. There's DynamoDB in there. There's uh, other ones that are uh, R, the RDS is in there. There's uh, different types, and then lots of lots of configuration for that. So. The, a AWS, that's exactly it. And it's multi-region so that when you enter information in sound credit, it is automatically copying to basically different regions across continents. So if we ever lost, if AWS ever had something crazy happen, we still have backups in two other places. How do you, uh, how do you lock down, can you lock down the metadata on the track? Um, Locking down the metadata on the track. So you not your credits in place on your track. You want to make sure those credits don't change at a later date. So when you do an export from Sound Credit, uh, so you could do, let's say you're doing our label copy export, you know, which people use uh, all the time. So you're submitting to the label. This is the final export for that, and this is what you're delivering. Whenever you do an export, it saves that into that project. And you can click into it. There's a little files button that is there. You can click into files, and there's the export tab. And so whatever you delivered to the label with the label copy export, you don't even have to think about it. It's stored. I mean, you can go in and delete it if you want to, you know, but it's stored automatically. So it captures that moment. But it's always the, but the project itself always remains editable because you can always have changes. Even five years down the road, somebody could have still could have accidentally left someone off or some new information comes to light or there could be something. So the project itself remains editable, but the exports that are exported are archived and they're for permanence. Can you get an audit trail on that? Absolutely. So with it, every time you do the export, all, across all exports, it, it, there's a date, there's a time, there's the export that occurred. You can load it, you can preview it without even having to download it. Super simple. Yeah, there's uh, there have been times where um, uh, clients have, you know, they, they give you what they think their final track list is with all the names. And are you sure? Okay. And then you export it and it's like, oh, we're changing the name of track three. It's no problem that you can just go back and change it, and then from that point on, the song will travel with that information. That's exactly right. Yes? Um, does, this, does this platform include, include like writer's credits, and is there also a connection to like copywriting and all that? Love that question. Love to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> because we have put so much time into that specifically. So you can click one button and register the work with ASCAP, BMI, and SOCAN. So that one was huge. There's also one for sound exchange in there as well. So uh, and there's extensive coverage for writers. So you can put in your publishing, you can put in sub pubs, you can put in territories, territory exclusions, any of the details you would need uh, for full writer information is there. Cool. Yeah. Um, so a track in the interface is primarily a single file with a bunch of metadata around it. Is there any provision for multiple file attachments that go along with that track or under that? So Absolutely. In workflow terms, you know, going from the tracking engineer to the mixing engineer, do they have to have a separate channel to pass the project, or can it actually be bundled? I love that question too, because this is the thing. So you know, it, when I showed the photo earlier of on stage with uh, with Larry back in 2018, uh, we got questions like that, and it would be like, oh no, you know. Uh, now we've uh, we've been at it for some years, and uh, so now I just love the questions because like, yeah, it does do that. Uh, so with this, um, if you're entering, if you create a sound credit project, whether you originate it with a playlist, it's really cool. If you create a playlist and uh, it, it, just to do your file sharing, it's automatically going to create the metadata project for you. So you can pop over in there. You can also just hit credits on the playlist itself, and then that'll take you over into where you can enter the credits and information and into the project. But the project can host all types of files. So you, we built it so that you could fully manage a record label on sound credit. So it can serve as your label copy system. And with all the research and interaction with the majors that we were doing to make the platform work for them. And whenever I'm on Zoom, I, I usually hold up this book. It's a 350-page hardbound book, which is the research that we did with Universal Music Group alone. 
And that's less than 10% of the total research that went into sound credit, not including the over 4 million lines of code that run the platform today. So all of that insights, all of that activity that we've had over the years is now baked into the platform. And an indie label can now use that that exact platform to manage their own information, store it in their own digital vault. But yes, you're exactly right. For If you've got a recording, you can have all the different versions right there. You can put your contracts in there. You can put promotional graphics. You can put anything related to it. You can tag it. You can search by tag. Uh, and that took a tremendous amount of work. And so, uh, and so I can answer that question with uh, absolute happiness. <laughs> Yeah, and it's uh, you can you can set it up from the playlist function, or you can uh, if you wanted to do it if if you think about data structures more in terms of this is an album or this is an EP, you can start a new project, set the amount of tracks in it, load the tracks in, load those credits, load the album art in, load anything that you want in, and then all of that stuff is baked in, and it will travel wherever that that project travels. Exactly. I saw, uh, looking at the homepage, I was looking, uh, I saw that you can also upload stems uh, of your music, which made me think about another uh, licensing conversation we had and how when you're licensing, you need to have all your stems. Is it easy to share stems with like licensors and, and kind of what are, what are other things that artists can do after the recording process with sound credit is kind of where I'm going with that as well. Yeah, so after recording, this is the part that we spent a lot of time on over the past couple of years, is that once you get the information into sound credit, you know, what can you do with it? You know, what do you do with this information when you get it in? So um, we have the playlists and transfer functions, which are really, really nice to get, draw people into the platform. And that's a lot of value. But if you start using these deeper features, yeah, you, you need to be able to do something with this stuff. And so uh, there are the, the exports and integrations that you can use for registration after the, after the process is complete. And we have so many. We have one for WaveLab and Sequoia, so you can just import the information for sending something to mastering. Uh, we have uh, split sheets. So if you're trying to get everyone to sign the split sheets, you can go into Sound Credit, and uh, it will email the split sheets to the writers that you have entered. And then they can go on their phone and do a binding legal e-signature for that. And it's, the list goes on and on. I mean, you can, reg you can send it to all music. You can, uh, you can export social media graphics that have the credits on it that looks really neat that you can post on your social media. The list just goes on and on. But, um, but other than the exports, the next thing that we've gotten into, and I alluded to this a little bit in my presentation, is that we've really been focused on now royalty payments. So we have uh, publishing administration, neighboring rights, and digital distribution. Uh, and the digital distribution is really focused on high quality data because we wanted to bring some equity to uh, distribution in this way, where the majors are metadata rich Indies are metadata poor, and what happens is the the music discovery algorithms are fed on data. You know, they're looking for connections, they're looking for details that can indicate that something's connected to another track. With the majors, they have high, the highest po possibility for uh, for discoverability because it's the data quality is rich. But for indies, uh, digital distributors, they they don't do a lot of credits and this and information and all that because they're trying to get you through their process and they're trying to get you to the distribution portion. They haven't built out the infrastructure for that. For, so for sound credit, uh, we've done that in fantastic fashion. So you get the highest quality data distribution along with your digital distribution. So those are those are a few of the things. Yeah, um, and that that point is really important. That that the uh, a really important hole that sound credit is filling is that when you're using uh, CD Baby or DistroKid or whatever, these these services that are uh, that are helping you with digital distribution are not caring for your metadata at all. They're not providing credits. None of that information is traveling. They're just putting your music places, and then it's there. That's fine, but there's no there's no context around the music. And sound credit really fills that hole. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am? Yeah, you. Yep. So, does the artist use this or the producer? Like, if I go to a studio and I record my music, if they're not using this, then is it something that I can initiate? 
That's exactly right. Yeah, so sound credit is a lot. There's a lot to the platform, and it's it's really built for everyone in music. You know, we have we have thought about songwriters tremendously. We've thought about the artists. We've thought about the administrators. We've thought about the labels. We've thought about the instrumentalists. We thought, and, and the list goes on. You know, we 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 have built sound credit to be something that uh, that every role in the music industry can use from the starting off indie through to uh, to the majors. And so uh, in doing that, we have refined the platform to make it easy to adopt and to get started with because it was like you're not gonna, you're probably not going to use sound credit and do everything in the first like week or two. It's like Pro Tools or something. You kind of learn it as you go a little bit. And we've really made it where that can occur. So I would say if you're getting started with sound credit and you're an artist and you're a self-managed artist, the first thing to do is to create a playlist. If you're transferring your files, if, if you're that moment where you think, oh, I'm going to send this with we transfer Google Drive or Dropbox, that's the first thing to change. If you change that piece and don't send it with those, send it with sound credit, then the rest of this, the discovery of the platform will evolve. Yeah. yeah. So you have made a special commitment. I, th was, I think the Larry Crane deal was a Music Portland event That's in right. 2018. We brought him here in 2018. And Larry Crane rocked his world because that's what Larry does. Um, and Gabri is back here now, and he is recommitted to Portland. And really, what we're trying to do collectively is you've heard about the way that the more of us that are in this, the better it is for all of us. And that's music to my ears as a way, as a, as a music ecology, that we all play with each other. We talk to each other, we're supporting each other. This is a platform we can all get together on. And um, for that reason, Music Portland, any member of Music Portland gets an unprecedented deal to get access to this. As I mentioned in the beginning, before you even knew what it was, it's like, it's like a couple of bucks a month. And they are committed to supporting Portland if we commit to them. Because the more that we as an ecology stand together on a platform like this, the easier our administration tasks are going to be, the better our income is going to be for the music that we create, and the better we can support a platform that's going to keep on evolving and supporting us. So of this, how many people loved what they heard? All right, that's awesome. Everybody needs to make sure that they set up with this platform. Check with us, you're gonna get a discount code if you're a member. Membership for an individual musician is $25 a year. Um, for an individual producer, it is $100 a year. Um, and it goes from there. But let's give Gabri a huge, th he flew from Memphis to be here. I have a question. So in, in a scenario, say there's a recording session, there's an engineer, there's a producer, there's some musicians. Um, who is expected to have a subscription to sound credit in that scenario? Is everyone, all the musicians, or how does it work? They could. If you have a subscription to Dropbox, we transfer a Google Drive. That's when you should evaluate having a subscription to sound credit. You know, so if if any of those if any of those roles would have a subscription this way, that's that's basically what I would say. And what, with Mira and what she just mentioned, she, she really means it. Bridget on our team this morning just set up those the uh, the um, discount codes, the coupon codes uh, for Music Portland. We have never done a discount like this. Uh, it is the best discount we have ever offered. It's 50% off of the platform for the first year. We have never done this. Uh, I, we wanted to do this as a symbol because, it, you know, this is not some sales BS right here. Like, Portland is meaningful to me. Adam was our first 
g- dedicated user. Larry and how he embraced sound credit and did a story about sound credit in our first six months, you know, and having it on the cover of Tape Op in that way, it just, that transforms so much. And I really appreciate Portland for that. And that's why I came here today, and that's why we're doing this deal. So, so it's not a situation, sorry. No, no, we're it's not a situation where, like, all the musicians have to be members or they can't get their credit on the thing. That's exactly right. If, if, the, if all the musicians are not members, anyone can enter their credit into Sound Credit on that project that is the, that's managing the credits for the project. You know, so they can go on and get a creator ID. The creator ID is free and they can manage their own information. Easy for them to pop on. It's just a free app on your phone. You can set it up and get that creator ID. Then anybody can pull them down. But even if they don't create, do the creator, the creator ID, as I mentioned earlier with the saved profiles, if you enter their information once and you're trying to credit them, you just go into your saved profiles, do a checkbox and hit open, and it's going to add them into the project. Yeah, go ahead, man. Is there a capacity of storage on the platform for profiles? Yeah, for each of the tiers, there is a storage limitation for each. So oh, I don't have it committed to memory, but it's on the website. You'll see it, and it's generous. Uh, so uh, you can store uh, files of all types. Um, it, it's there. Yeah, one more, David. Hey, hey. Do you have a question coming up? Uh, I believe, I think it's file pass as, as a feature where I, as a mix engineer, I can send a client uh, a, a finished mix and they can maybe listen to it, but they can't download it until they pay me through the platform. Do you have a similar feature as that? Yeah, that's exactly right. So when you create a sound credit playlist, uh, in the share settings, uh, e- there is an option for download only or, uh, or you know, or, or not, you know, so or, or allow downloads or not. So if you, dis- if you unselect that, uh, it's selected by default, then they can only stream. And if you send it to them, if they haven't paid you yet, you don't send them the download. You don't check that until they pay you. But the, there's not an option to have your platform collect the pay, payment and then automatically switch on the download capability. The One of the complaints that we heard, well, I don't want to talk about competitor ne- negatively, but it's um, some people want flexibility about where their payments happen and how they sure. do their payments. So that was a decision in making sound credit so that you could switch the download option or not. But it, it, so you can um, you can manage it in that way, but you can use any payment processor that you want. I see. Yeah. Going off that, is there an option to only have um, a user download the MP3 of the file rather than like, of the upload the file that was put on, let's say, like? That is the only question I'm going to answer no to you on this one. Uh, so you can't. we don't make it where you could do an MP3 only download. Uh, if you select download, then they can download the WAVE or the MP3. Unless you uh, uploaded an MP3 originally, then it's only going to be an MP3, of course. Uh, lots of uh, specific use cases across the music industry. So Gabri is not going anywhere. If you guys want to talk to him afterwards, please. Uh, he's an approachable and affable chap. And uh, please join me in thanking him for coming to talk about his fantastic platform. Thank you so much, man. writers and actors strike and why music is not stepping up and going well we're with them too because AI and other things are going to be dangerous. One thing is that November 4th we are co-hosting and co-producing an event on music and technology that takes the fear out of it and makes it actionable specifically for independent musicians. That's being done with Water and Music that's a New York based information technology company that is actually assessing music technology. It's going to be a great event, but in the meantime, we have an amazing resource in Bruce Fife, who, when I posed the question to him, actually had an answer. Do you want to give a quick a quick roundup as we talked about? Sure. Um, so, actually, and actually, this is a, a, a playthrough of what, everything we just heard, too. So, I, I had to laugh. One of the reasons the reporting used to be better 
was because it was probably all on union contracts back then. And as you know, times changed and less got done on union contracts, the reporting got worse and worse. But the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers is who SAG-AFTRA and the writers are striking. Um, as the international, former international vice president of the AFM, I sat across from the table from those assholes three or four times. <laughs> and they are truly assholes. And what they are trying to do is eliminate the royalty structure. Yes, it's about AI. AI is very important, and it's a component, especially for the actors who they want to be able to take a digital picture of and use it forever um, without having to pay anything. But for, for the musicians, and this is the through line for what you're doing here, which is we've been working on this in a number of ways for years. I'll be looking at this really closely. I hope that's everything that, that is as described. Um, if you have a recording that gets used, well, let me, let me step back. A film that is done under a union contract, all of the musicians that were part of that contract, when it's released in the theaters, that is its initial release. After that, per our contract, there is what's called the Film Musician Secondary Markets Fund. And every place that film earns money after that initial theatrical release pays a percentage of gross revenue into this fund for distribution to all the musicians that were on that fund. So if you were on the scoring session for Oppenheimer, scored AFM, as long as that film is making money after it leaves the theaters, a percentage of their gross royalties goes into this fund for distribution. They've got to be able to find you, don't, don't they? Mm -hmm. If they can't you find you, yeah. they're not going to be able to pay you. Now, it's not just the studio musicians that recorded the score. If you have a place, a film that was placed in that film, you're part of that. So that's where what you're doing is, is extremely critical because you want to be able to be found for those secondary markets. That is what they're trying to take away because if a, if a film is created for Netflix, there is no secondary market. It goes to Netflix and dies. We will not see anything after that. So that's why that theatrical release model, which is what we've had for the last hundred years or so, and why the union contract is based around that model and has that secondary market's royalty stream, it's all shifting. Another example where we've sort of successfully negotiated part one is with what's called our live TV video agreement, where that covers Saturday Night, all the live t music on TV, Saturday Night Live, Colbert Report, Academy Awards, anywhere where there's live music is covered by this live TV video. So when we were negotiating that with the networks, Saturday Night Live would take a clip off the show and put it online five minutes after the show was done, and the musicians get nothing for it. Now they do. It was a great moment of, of my negotiating history was to be at ABC, and we had about half the Saturday Night Live band in the, in the uh, negotiation with us, because we wanted to hear, we wanted them to hear their proposal. They offered five dollars per musician per clip in perpetuity. Oh. That was their first, you know, offer across the table. We now get a percentage of their gross revenue from streaming for those musicians. So, but you got to know who the musicians yeah. are. Yeah. It all comes back to knowing who the musicians are. And too many people, like like your buddy, never did any of this stuff. And so. Um, that's what this strike is about. The reason we are not striking as musicians right now, so the AMPTP, Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, negotiates with all the unions. They negotiate with the writers, the directors, with the stagehands, with, with us, with the Teamsters. With every, the, all they do is negotiate with all the labor contracts. In our contract, we have what is called the no strike, no, strike, no lockout clause. We cannot strike until the contract is actually expired. We go back into negotiations with them in November. That's when the contract expires. We can start negotiating before then. But until that time happens, we can't actually 
strike them, we are certainly walking the picket lines in New York and Los Angeles. sag -Aftra had a rally here two weeks ago uh, down, downtown at, a, at one of the parks. So we are actively involved in it, but not striking yet because it's illegal for us. And there's, there's my answer right there. I knew you could have got it. You bring us home, Renee, and then we're all going to hang out for an hour or more, and you can ask Gabri all the questions you didn't dare to ask. Yeah. Real quick, uh, we mentioned that if you are a paying member, that you can get the discount that Gabri is offering. Also, the the event that Mara mentioned with Water Music is also discounted for members. Those are just two examples of what you can get as a member through Music Portland, and so. Uh, talk to me if you want to join. I can show you a QR code on my phone, or it's musicportland.org slash join. So pretty easy. Yeah. That's all. Let's all go outside and enjoy the last of the waning sunshine. Yeah. And talk about how we can all do better. Let's do it. <laughs> Woo! Did you get my good side? Oh, all, all the side. Yeah, right. <laughs> I got all your suggestions. Did you? Yeah. Dynamic. Very dynamic.